Today's headline is these trains carry armed guards. It says armed guards still travel on the trains that run through the Indian Territory, the paradise of train robbers, says a Western exchange. If you take the Katy Fire from St. Louis to Dallas, Texas, you'll see a couple of guards climb aboard a Veneta at about 6 o'clock in the evening and see them jump stiffly out at Denison, Texas at 7 in the morning. They'll be coddling their short, neat rifles familiarly as they go across to sleep at the hotel. The steady development of the West, its capable judiciary and active constables, the multiplying network of telegraph lines, its consistent advance towards economic and civic importance, all these things have combined to throw train robbing as a business into the far limbo of neglect and disapproval. Special conditions are necessary to the prosecution of the trade, and special conditions exist still in only one part of this country, the Indian Territory. There, where political and social chaos reigns, Winchester armed guards still climb into the express cars of the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad when a night train reaches the limits of its territory. And there the sudden squealing of the brake shoes in the gloom of a creek woods, or on the staring loneliness of the prairie, still warns the experienced traveler to lie close in his berth, his purse convenient to hand in case the impatient gentleman of the road should failing sufficient reward from the express car decide to rob the passengers. Out of that country still come occasional dispatches to the eastern newspapers that wake the memories of the old familiar golden age of the outlaw. Where criminals thrive. Of one kind and another, the Indian Territory has perhaps harbored more criminals than any other small section of the United States. Granted originally to the sole use and occupation of the Indians, with the guarantee of the general government to keep out all intruding white men, the country early became a rendezvous for those who knew and obeyed no law. Horse fees, whiskey peddlers, bigamists, murderers, old-time road agents. These and the class of pure adventurers, asking leave neither of the United States nor the Indians, follow close on the heels of the builders of the first railroad for the new country, the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. The neighboring states were glad to be rid of a disturbing class and left them to work out their salvation in the new surroundings as pleased them best, only keeping a watchful eye upon the border against any attempted return. How the population was made up. In various ways, these transplanted criminals worked out their fate. Not a few married Indian wives and settled down to a quiet, easy citizenship in the tribes. Don't press for the man's history, and you may leave an ex-convict's house with the belief that he is one of the finest fellows you ever met. Some of the right-minded enrolled themselves in the police force, becoming zealous and capable officers. A fairly numerous class maintained an illegal traffic in whiskey with the Indians, bootleggers, saddle pocket men, and the more daring, who in the dead of night, hold it in by the barrel. Few indeed dare to continue horse and cattle stealing for the simple reason that this was the easiest thing in the world to do, and consequently the most summarily and rigorously punished. Thus local crimes, excluding the frequent private brawls, were of rare occurrence. But the idea came to a member of the notorious Younger Gang that the Indian Territory offered a much safer field of operation than Missouri or Minnesota, where the state authorities were anxious to retrieve the reputation of their commonwealths. With two or three companions, he went down to the Indian Territory, gathered a few more followers, and almost before they had covered their heads with shanties, held up a train in the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas, near Muskogee. Reports said that the hole was a rich one. The matter had been accomplished with a great flourish. The style of the robbers was much discussed and admired. The railroad detectives were discouraged, the outlaws aided in their fights and warned of pursuit. Bell Star, the Woman Bandit After a time, a woman joined the band, wife of one, and under the name of Bell Star, spread her fame far beyond the Indian borders. She was assuredly young, and she rode as wildly as the men. But beyond this, reports said that she was a crack shot with the rifle and pistol, that she rode a straddle, that she actually took part in the holdups, and that she was in truth a queen of the bandits. Sombrero tops, hooted, and spurred like the men, erect in carriage, supple, graceful, beautiful. The picture of Bell's star graced the pages of the illustrated papers, and it were, after all, better to think of her so than as a broken, consumptive woman dying in a dingy jail where she was sent with her mate when a determined little posse of United States deputies swooped down on the gang unannounced and carried them away to Fort Smith. Rise of the Dalton Gang The later Dalton Gang, four brothers, and as many more brave and intelligent associates, 
came near to reproducing the real flavor of romance than any who had preceded them in the business of pilfering express cars. The Daltons came into the territory trained to the trade, three of them having worked in the famous Evans Suntag and Suntag trio in Southern California. The spectacular ending of the Evans Suntag partnership after an all day duel between a house full of deputies and two of the outlaws behind a stack of stable refuse sent the Daltons packing from California to the Indian Territory. Here they lived quietly for a time, winning friends all over the country, working as cowboys, and winning reputations as hail fellows, good rifle shots, and staunch friends. One or two holdups, cleverly managed, carried through without a hitch, set people to wondering who the robbers were. Still the Daltons held their jobs and were not suspected. But the holdup of a train on the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas, near Adair, on which half a dozen well-armed guards were posted, and from which an unusually large hole was made, served to rouse the officers to an extraordinary activity. Robbers who could sweep the length of a train with a fire that kept even a Winchester armed guard inside, who could uncouple the express car from the passenger coaches, run away into the woods with it, crack it open, take it back to the train, and send the hole on to the next station without exposing themselves to a single shot. Certainly these were of an extraordinary cleverness. Finally, the officers picked the Daltons as the criminals, but the community was incredulous, knowing and caring little for the brothers' former reputation. So completely had these genial fellows won the confidence of the ranchmen and cowboys that the officers for a long time dared not to try to arrest them. A sense of security emboldened them. They missed an attempt on the Arkansas Valley Road. Bob was wounded, and the community had indisputable evidence of their guilt, but still public opinion shielded them. The railroad could, in the opinion of the countryside, easily afford their losses, and the boys had made themselves popular and pleasant. One day, three of the Daltons, accompanied by three others, rode leisurely up to Coffeeville, Kansas, four miles over the border of the Indian country, hitching their horses, and walked over to rob the bank. An obstinate, faithful cashier delayed them unduly. The town woke out of a lethargy, and when the boys made a rush for their horses, shotguns, rifles, and pistols popped at them from all sides. These were annoying, but not fatal, until a calm, sleepy-eyed livery stable helper climbed into a barn loft with a Winchester, stretched himself comfortably on his stomach, and began to pick off the bandits as they mounted and started to ride away. Two of the brothers were killed by the livery stable man. The other was wounded and captured, and but a single member of that band reached the territory to tell young Bill Dalton of the fate of his brothers. Young Dalton's Revenge This young brother, just past twenty, resented bitterly the summary taking off of his relatives. He talked freely with the sympathizing cowboys of revenge. He came and went, free of molestation, and at last he drew together a little band of his own. He was a brave boy and shrewd, but he spent most of his energy running away from the officers after he had indiscreetly murdered an inoffensive citizen. It was all very well to rob a rich railway corporation, said the Indian Territory people. In their view, it was mere retaliation. But when a ranchman was not safe from the whim of a fool, hot-headed boy, it was quite time to stop him. Bill Dalton led his pursuers a long chase, but was finally wounded, captured, and thrown into prison to die. Bob Rogers, an insignificant-looking, slight-limbed little cowpuncher who had known the Daltons, induced two of his companions to help run off two carloads of cattle from the Indian country to Kansas in the night. The cattle were sold. The buyer shipped them to Kansas City where the territory ranchman spotter sold him, and the theft was soon charged to Rogers. That made him an outlaw, and with his companions, he tried train robbing. One success and one failure within a year made him talked about considerably, but he was never regarded as a clever leader. When the United States deputies were ready, after the railroad's offered rewards had mounted to a respectable figure, they were led by Heck Burner, who was a blacksmith by trade, to Rogers' rendezvous. Here, in the middle of the night, a freezing winter wind howling outside. They fell upon the gang asleep in a cabin, killed two, and captured the other three. With the extinction of the Rogers gang, train robbing fell into disfavor for a number of years, and the railroad companies tired of paying guards to ride in their express cars. But a holdup down at the edge of Texas, another wild chase with a posse, later forays of little parties, and occasional single-handed attacks warned the express agents to renew their vigilance. This story came from the great state of Pennsylvania, being reported in the Philadelphia Inquirer of July 27, 1902.
Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.